Welcome back, everybody, to the Tennessee Titans franchise here on Madden 23. It's been around a week and a half since the previous episode of the series, and I do apologize for the wait. The reason is that I wanted to get the first season of the NCAA Next Up Dynasty fully done with. I wanted to get through the offseason there just to figure out which juniors and sophomores would be leaving school early to declare for the draft. That way I could put those players into the draft class for this series before we get into the offseason. We're going to be doing a prospect profile today on the underclassmen who have just declared for the draft. All the players we've gone over so far throughout the season are seniors. We knew they were going to be in the draft anyway. These are the players who are a little bit younger and have just entered. Along with the prospect profile, we'll also be doing a full season one recap. And then the next few episodes of this series, we're going to go over the offseason with a free agency video, a draft preview video, and then of course the 2023 NFL draft, which I am very excited about. So here in Season 1, our Tennessee Titans went 9-8. and eight. Unfortunately, we were unable to grab a playoff spot. I don't think this season was a failure, but we also didn't complete our goals of getting a wild card spot or winning the division, largely because of how good the AFC was. The AFC was miles better than the NFC, and if we were in the NFC, we would have, without a doubt, made it into the postseason. So unfortunately, we kind of got dealt a bad hand by playing a loaded schedule. Our division was obviously really good with the Jags and Colts both winning 12 games this year. So things didn't exactly work out how we hoped for, but we certainly were not a bad team by any stretch. As you can look at the standings here, we were the 15th best team in the league. That would mean we would get the 18th pick, but... There are three teams below us who made the playoffs, so if my math is correct, we should get the 15th overall pick in the NFL Draft this year, which is obviously going to be very important because there are a lot of really good players in this draft class. Let's kick off our prospect profile now and take a look at some of the underclassmen who have just entered the draft. Throughout the season, we've been hyping guys up such as Clyde Williamson, Saru Lee, and Zyrus Okpoko as top prospects. Those guys are all seniors. Let's talk about some of the juniors and sophomores who we have not gotten a chance to talk about throughout the season. And that starts at the quarterback position with Genesis Moon, the redshirt junior out of Florida, who is currently the third projected quarterback off the board and will likely be a day two pick. I think Genesis Moon has the upside of the starting quarterback. He's really got the arm talent along with good ability with his legs. He has all the physical traits you look for. Six foot four, 215 pounds. He had a strong season this year for the Florida Gators. Missed some time towards the end of the season with a minor shoulder injury, but I don't think that's going to be an issue going forward for him. He only has one year of starting experience, and there were some bumps in the road this year. He's far from a polished product and probably isn't ready to start, but if you can develop him, I think he could be a really, really good player. I think look out for teams like Seattle, Atlanta, the Giants, teams who aren't picking at the very top of the draft, but may look to add a quarterback in the offseason. The other underclassman QB to enter the draft is Texas quarterback Benedict Sparrow, who was one of the more polarizing players in college football this past season. Texas had major expectations entering the SEC and they floundered badly, largely because of Benedict Sparrow. He had some really good throws throughout the season like this one, but for every big throw he made, there were always some bad ones. Sparrow led college football this year with 21 interceptions. He has all the physical tools. He's six foot three, 225 pounds. He's athletic. He's got a really strong arm but he's just not consistent at all. He doesn't go through his progressions very well. He usually looks for his first read, and that's a little bit concerning, especially considering he had plenty of weapons and one of the best offensive lines in the country at Texas. He was put in a position to thrive and really did not thrive. So because of that, I think it's going to be hard for a team to pick him before day three, but there are some physical tools, and if you can develop him, he can be really, really good. I think some team's going to want to take a shot on him. And then all the other quarterbacks in here, they were seniors. We already kind of went over them. Moving forward to the running back position, I was a little bit surprised to see how many underclassmen in terms of the top running backs in college football did not declare for the draft. Most of them are staying for their senior season, but there are a few good ones down the board. Texas lost both of their main running backs, Amadeo Kalu and Asante Baker, both juniors. 
for declaring early. However, I think the real name to watch at running back is Benny Dixon out of Kentucky, also a redshirt junior. He led the Wildcats to a double-digit win season as Kentucky finished 11-3 in a loaded SEC conference. Kentucky's definitely a run-first offense, and Benny Dixon was one of their best players. He is super explosive. You talk about speed, quickness, and agility. He has it all. Dixon did not run for 1,000 yards this season, but he only had 147 carries. He averaged nearly 7 yards a pop. So because of that, I don't think he's going to be a true workhorse back in the NFL, but I think he's going to be a great change of pace back, and that's the type of player that a team like the Titans could use on this offense behind Derrick Henry. This receiver class is absolutely loaded with talent, and because of that, I think most of the underclassmen wanted to stay in school. That way they could have a better chance of being a high pick in the future. North Carolina wide receiver Rambo Lumpkins had other plans, and despite only being a redshirt sophomore with just one season of starting experience, he has decided to enter the NFL draft and is being looked at by many as a possible first-round pick. This guy is a fully incredible physical specimen, 6'4", 230 pounds. He's fast, he's quick, he can make plays after the catch. His hands could be a little bit more consistent, and he does need to improve as a route runner, but he did have a great season for the Tar Heels catching 15 touchdowns with over 1,100 yards, and most of that was with a backup quarterback. North Carolina's starting QB, Graham Fisher, got injured earlier in the season, so he did that with a backup throwing him a ball, which is really, really impressive. As I just touched on a moment ago, a lot of the underclassmen wide receivers all had the same idea of why not try to be a first-round pick next year instead of declaring this year when you know you're going to be probably a third or fourth-round pick, even those top guys. However, there were some other players like Rambo Lumpkins who took the leap of faith and are entering the draft this year, including Jaden Wilson Miller out of Alabama, who is the draft's youngest player at only 20 years old. Wilson Miller was not dealt the best hand this year at Alabama. They're a run-first team, their two running backs had over 1,500 yards each, and the quarterback play was very inconsistent. However, Jaden Wilson Miller's production was also very inconsistent, but when you watch him, he just passes the eye test. He knows how to play receiver, he knows how to get open, and although he may not be the fastest, he may not be the biggest, he may not be the most explosive, he's a really, really smart football player, despite just being 20 years old. He reminds me of guys like Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams, and Keenan Allen, who aren't the biggest, who aren't the fastest. Those guys aren't physical freaks, but they know how to play receiver at a high level, and I think Jaden Wilson Miller has a similar skill set to those guys. Although he was a little bit disappointing this season after a great freshman campaign, I still think he warrants a day two pick, but some teams are concerned of the lack of production that he had this past season. Looking down the board further, there are some junior receivers projected to go on day three. Jaden White from Notre Dame, another guy stuck in a run first offense. You've got Vachan Kodali, Xavier White, and Michael Starks Jr. as well down the board even further. There were no underclassmen tight ends who declared for the draft, although there were plenty of offensive linemen. Killian Curry, the left tackle out of Oklahoma, projects to be a fringe top 100 pick. O.B. Darren, a guard from USC, is a pretty talented player. Then we come to Tyshawn Stallings, the center out of the University of Virginia. So Stallings is an interesting case because he had a great season this year with the Virginia Cavaliers. He won some awards as one of the best offensive linemen in the country as just being a junior. However, I do think his NFL ceiling is a little bit limited. He doesn't have elite athleticism. He's also not the biggest guy, six foot one, a little bit under 300 pounds. He's probably going to want to gain some weight, add some more strength. But the production this season is too much to ignore. So because of that, I do think he warrants a likely late day two, early day three selection. And the Titans do need a starting center with Ben Jones creeping up there in age. At right guard, there are a couple underclassmen who declared Wellington St. Angelo and Remington Bousset. Then as we move to right tackle, one of the highest projected underclassmen in this year's draft is Xavier Merville out of Oklahoma. Merville's a very interesting player. He's a giant, 6'8", 284 pounds. He does have the physical tools of a future NFL star. However, the production with him is very inconsistent. He had to face off against SEC pass rushers this season, and although at times he showed flashes, he had some very good games this year. 
he also had some not so good games. So you're taking a little bit of the gamble with him, probably in the middle of the first round, but his size, his length, his athleticism might be too hard for a team to pass on in the 15 to 20 range, pretty much right where the Titans are projected to pick. And then Chris Wallingsburg out of Ohio State, another late entry to the draft. He'll probably be a day three pick. As we look at defensive end, there are a few guys here, Danny Fox, Dayton Clements, but the name to watch, for, in my opinion, is Tyreek Callahan from South Alabama. He's also only 20 years old, and he had a great season this year for the best defense in college football. South Alabama made it not just to the college football playoff, but they made it to the national championship game on the back of their defense. Tyreek Callahan had a scoop and score touchdown in the semifinal playoff game against Michigan. He has the size, length, athleticism, and production to warrant a top 100 pick in the NFL draft. And I think we're going to see an influx of some of these South Alabama players as future NFL stars. And I think Tyree Callahan does have that type of upside going forward. A defensive tackle, there's Bartholomew Ellenbridge. Not that great of a prospect. I'm not really sure why he declared. A lot of linebackers, though, I will say that as we start with Cooley Gondro from Notre Dame. Notre Dame had both of their starting outside linebackers declare early for the draft. Gondro is a player who has great physical ability. 6'3", 226 pounds. He's not the best in coverage. He's probably more of a 3-4 outside linebacker. I don't know if he has the size and strength to play defensive end, so because of that, he's a little bit of a tweener. You maybe try to figure out if he can improve in coverage, or he might just be stuck as a 3-4 run-stopping, sometimes hybrid pass-rushing linebacker. Compton Neeson out of Miami is an interesting player as well. He's really small, under six foot, but he plays a lot bigger than his size suggests. Super athletic, he can get to zero to 100 real quick with great burst and acceleration. And this is a guy who can do a little bit of everything. He can get to the quarterback, he can stop the run, but he is really good in coverage. So you can line him up pretty much anywhere on your defense as a Swiss Army knife. I think he's going to be especially good in sub packages aligned as a linebacker in the box. As we go to right outside linebacker, Kendall Zavitz from South Carolina is a projected possible first round pick towards the back end of round one. Zavitz has the physical upside that defensive coordinators are drooling over. He's a big dude, six foot three, over 230 pounds, but he is big, he's athletic, he's fast, and he's got super long arms. He had a very up-and-down season this year for South Carolina. You've got a lot of good plays with him. He can get to the quarterback. He can make splash plays in coverage, but he's just not the most consistent, and he does have a ways to go. So he's going to be a little bit raw entering the NFL, but with his athletic upside, I think somebody's going to take a chance on him in the first round and hope they can develop him because if he is developed properly, he has a chance to be one of the better linebackers in the league. We've got some interesting day two guys behind him, including Justin Savage out of Cincinnati. Savage had a great season this year, mainly as a pass rusher. Six foot seven, 242 pounds. He's built more like a defensive end. I think he's mainly going to be used as an edge rusher in the NFL. I think ideally he'll bulk up, maybe gain 15 to 20 pounds of strength. He had a great season this year off the edge for Cincinnati. 30 tackles for loss, seven and a half sacks. He really broke out of the Bearcat defense and has taken advantage by declaring for the draft a year early. Pierre Madison from Notre Dame is also an intriguing player, probably going to be a guy who goes in the third or fourth round. As you look at his physical ability, he's 6'2", 236 pounds. Now, he's not a great pass rusher. He's more of a cover guy. That's why him and Cooley Gondro, the other Notre Dame linebacker we just talked about a minute ago, that's why they worked out so well, because they had very differing skill sets. I think Madison's going to be a little bit more versatile, but he doesn't have that great ability to go after the quarterback, which is obviously a big deal. As we go to cornerback now, there are some interesting young underclassmen to watch for, including C.J. Thomas Jr. from LSU. You may recognize this name. C.J. Thomas, the great corner from our Eagles series, was a staple on that defense. C.J. Thomas Sr. was known for his size, his length, and most of all, his ball skills. C.J. Thomas was better than anybody in the NFL at tracking the football and intercepting passes. And his son, C.J. Thomas Jr., actually reminds me a lot of him. C.J. Thomas Jr. is also really tall. He stands at 6'3". He's also got those great ball skills as well. Maybe not quite as good as his dad in terms of getting interceptions, but still really, really solid. And he's a guy who I think warrants a first-round pick. 
great athleticism. He's pretty solid in coverage. He's a good tackler. And as I said, the ball skills with him are really good. So I think he's probably going to be a late first, early second round pick. Pretty much the exact range that his dad ended up being selected by the Eagles in our series last year. So I'm excited to see how he does at the next level. Raymond Foster Hess from Penn State looks to be a possible late day two selection. Six foot, 190 pounds. He's got good size. He's an athletic cornerback. I think he can play on the outside and on the slot. Super fast, super quick. And then as you look at the numbers, the production is all there. He's taken a step up this year for Penn State. His ball skills have really improved. And his development has been very, very linear at Penn State. He's always shown consistent improvement every year, which is a good thing. I and mean, I think that is something that's probably going to keep going in the NFL. I think he's going to continue to get better and be a good player. Marcus Mayhew from Tennessee looks to also be a possible late third round selection towards the back end of day two. He's another guy who also has solid production as you look at his size. He's six foot one, 182 pounds, another guy who's pretty fast. He's good in man and zone, and I think he has the flexibility to play on the outside and in the slot. But with his size, obviously you're hoping to develop him as an outside corner, and I think he could be a really, really solid player down the line. Although he does need a little bit of work, he's not the most consistent. The other junior corner to declare is Nate Turner from Alabama. I'm not really sure why he declared. I think he could have been a really high pick next year. Doesn't have a lot of reps because he was Alabama's fourth corner. We do have some safeties as well. Zinzan Carlin out of Purdue, Craig Charles, Marco Franklin, Yannick Tibbolt. But the name to really watch, in my opinion, is Delonte Runyon out of North Carolina. Runyon's going to be a pretty late pick when it's all said and done, probably a 6th or 7th rounder, and that's because of the lack of consistent production. Only a one-year starter, and to be honest, he wasn't all that good <laughs> this year, so you're probably wondering why he made the decision to declare. It's all about the physical tools, man. This kid has some real upside. Super fast, super athletic. Although he's 5'11", he's got a 6'4 wingspan, and he had some real splash plays on the film this year. Now, again, he was not great this year at North Carolina, which is why he's probably not going to go before the sixth round. But there is some real athletic potential with him. And if you can get him in a system where he can develop, he's got a chance to be one of the better starting safeties in the NFL. I have not shown anybody the special teams yet. I know some people want to see them. So there you go. Those are all the special teamers. And with that, we have officially gone through the entire Season 1 draft class. Now that all of the underclassmen are finally here, the draft class is fully done, making us ready for the offseason over the next couple of episodes. So now we're going to do our full Season 1 recap for the Titans franchise. I kind of went over it a little bit at the beginning of the episode, but we're going to go into more detail here. So this roster is in an interesting spot because we are an older team. The core is filled with mainly veterans, and the goal of this season was to try to run it back, see how well we could do, see if this team can make another run. And I think based on where the rest of the AFC is compared to us, I think it might be time to tear it down and kind of restart. I think we're kind of going to be entering a rebuild going into this offseason. Not to say we're going to be bad next year, but the roster is going to look a lot different. Let's talk about what went right on this team, what went wrong as we take a look at the season stats. Obviously, Derrick Henry is the first answer to the question of what went right. Henry had a great season with nearly 1,900 rushing yards and 15 touchdowns, averaging 6 yards a carry. Now, Derrick Henry is going to be entering his age 29 season, and although I still view him as a long-term piece for our team, I don't think him getting 300 touches a year is going to be good because I don't want to run him into the ground. So I think we're going to certainly look to add another running back, whether that's through three agency or the draft or both. It is nice having Malik Willis's legs being a real threat, but Hassan Haskins and Bo Melton behind Henry didn't really move the needle for me this year. The run game was really good. We really leaned on the run throughout the season, and it was a positive. The pass game, eh, not so much. In terms of passing yards, we finished in dead last in the NFL. Obviously, our biggest storyline this season was the quarterback switch for Ryan Tannehill to Malik Willis. And while Ryan Tannehill will probably be on a new team next season, I do feel pretty optimistic about Malik Willis's future here. He started the final six games of the season for us and was honestly pretty good. There were some bad moments with Malik Willis. Don't get me wrong. He's not perfect. I'm not sold on him as our franchise quarterback, but... He has certainly earned another opportunity as our starting quarterback next year. So because of that, we won't be on the, in the QB market this offseason. 
but I do think the supporting cast needs a lot of help. The longest pass of the entire season was only 50 yards, showing that we really don't have a lot of explosiveness at wide receiver. The offensive line allowed 43 sacks this season. So, again, the receiving core wasn't great, the offensive line wasn't great, and in my opinion, wide receiver and offensive line are the two biggest needs for this football team going into the offseason. Robert Woods led the team in receiving this year, mainly because Burks and Odell were both out through large chunks of the season. Robert Woods was acquired so the offense could have a consistent receiver, and I don't feel like he was all that consistent this year, I've got to be honest. Woods is locked up for a while, so he's probably going to stick around. Hopefully, he'll be able to improve next year. He wasn't bad this season, but I would have liked to have seen more. Traylon Burks, on the other hand, I did like what I saw. And although he did miss the final five games of the season, he was fantastic when he was on the field. He probably would have won Offensive Rookie of the Year had he never gotten injured. And I'm very confident about him being a piece of our future. Odell Beckham, on the other hand, I'm not really sure. I think Beckham was really good once he got back from his injury, but he wants a lot of money this offseason, and, well, quite frankly, I'm not sure I'm willing to pay that to him. Other than those top three, I wasn't really all that impressed with anybody else. We're probably going to be in the market for a tight end this offseason, and we're certainly going to be looking at wide receiver through three agency and the draft. The offensive line as well, not really a strength. Other than Nate Davis, I'm not convinced any of these guys are going to stick around long term. Taylor Lewan and Ben Jones are getting older, and then left guard and right tackle were both disasters this season. The defense, I think, was a little bit better than the offense. Obviously, at the top, led by David Lawn and Zach Cunningham, are two inside linebackers. I'm not sure how long these two guys are going to be with our team. Zach Cunningham's on a really big contract. He could be a cap casualty, and he may have some trade value after having a really good season. And then David Lawn just does not want to come back here for Lord knows what reason. We're going to try to re-sign him in the offseason, but it seems like he wants to join a new team this upcoming season. I think Harold Landry was definitely one of our best defensive players this year. Started the season slow, but really played well after the bye week. Jeffrey Simmons was inconsistent. He was banged up at times. Hopefully he's a little bit better next season. And then Bud Dupree, also solid, but I'm not sure he's going to be a long-term piece. Looking at the secondary, in my opinion, this group was the strength of the team. You look at our four corners, Caleb Farley, Elijah Bolden, Christian Fulton, and Roger McCreary, all on rookie contracts, all played very well. Kevin Byard had a good season too, and Imani Hooker was pretty solid as well. Hooker's on the last year of his deal. He has not been brought back yet, and then we're probably going to draft a corner anyway, just because the cornerback class is so loaded. So overall, I think the defense was pretty good, but we are probably going to add some holes. There are some older players there. Of course, Randy Bullock was great, didn't miss a kick all year, and Brett Kern did his thing as well. Let's take a look at more of a broad league-wide recap, taking a look at some of the awards. Joe Shiesty, Joe Burrow, wins the NFL MVP. None of our guys in the top 10, unsurprisingly. Doug Peterson wins the Coach of the Year. Jonathan Taylor wins AFC Offensive Player of the Year with Derrick Henry in 7th. Von Miller wins Defensive Rookie of the Year. Brees Hall is the Offensive Rookie of the Year with Traylon Burks in 5th. Again, I think he would have won if not for his injury. Malik Willis finishes in 6th. Kyle Phillips in ninth, And Hassan Haskins in 10th. Devin Lloyd of the rival Jags wins the Defensive Rookie of the Year with Roger McCreary in 10th. Again, a little bit disrespectful. I think he should have been higher. I thought McCreary was really good. Derrick Henry finished third for the Best Running Back Award. And then we did have some guys show up for the defensive ones as well. Harold Landry finished in fourth for the Best Linebacker. Zach Cunningham finished in tenth, despite missing like three games, I think. Very impressive. And then we had Caleb Farley finish second for Best DB, only behind J.C. Jackson, with Elijah Molden in fifth and Kevin Byard in seventh. Two spots ahead of my guy, Chidobe Awuzie. Randy Bullock obviously won the best kicker. No brainer there. For the NFC, usual suspects. Cooper Cup at like 2,200 yards. He wins the Offensive Player of the Year. Aaron Donald wins Depoy. Aiden Hutchinson wins the Defensive Rookie of the Year. If only he was that good in real life. I think the biggest surprise here is definitely Baker Mayfield winning the best quarterback. He had a great season for the Panthers. Led them to the playoffs. So pretty much the complete opposite of how the Panthers are doing currently in real life. Let's take a look at these playoffs as a whole. We have a lot of fun matchups in the wild card round. Let's simulate through, take a look at what happened, and there you go. The seven-seeded Bills upset the Miami Dolphins, and then the other lower seed to win is Washington upsetting the defending champion LA Rams. In the conference championships, the Colts will face off against the Bills in the AFC. Buffalo upset the number one seeded Ravens, and then it will be Green Bay, and who would have guessed, the Carolina Panthers in the NFC Championship. All right, let's simulate through conference championship week. Who will be facing off in the Super Bowl? 
we've got the Bills and, ew, the Packers. So, pretty fun matchup as Green Bay beats Carolina and the Bills defeat the Red Hot Indianapolis Colts. For the next three minutes, I am going to be a loud and proud member of Bills Mafia. Let's take a look at the Pro Bowl rosters here. Baker Mayfield and Russell Wilson are the top two quarterbacks. The irony. Derrick Henry, of course, makes it. He ended up being our only offensive player, which really isn't a surprise. Nobody else on the offense deserved it other than him. However, I do think they kind of disrespected us on defense. The only defensive player who made it for us was Zach Cunningham, who did deserve it, but I feel maybe Harold Landry or Caleb Farley should have gotten in, but stay hating NFL. I think the most egregious snub of all, though, is Randy Bullock. He won the best kicker award, but Evan McPherson makes the Pro Bowl over him, which makes no sense. I don't think McPherson was perfect, therefore he was not better than fat Randy Bullock this year. We also have a scenario here. Are we going to have fun? Yeah, we're going to have fun. I'm not worrying about re next season during Pro Bowl week. That seems pretty stupid. Why not just kick back, enjoy the week, and have some fun? We also have a breakout challenge for Christian Fulton, who is not on the Pro Bowl roster. But apparently, we can up his depth trade. We can't do any of the individual ones because obviously he is not playing. But if the NFC team has under 200 yards, then he will go up in development trade, and I do not know why. All right, let's get into the Pro Bowl game between the NFC and the AFC. Ended up being a pretty low-scoring game, but the NFC would win 17-13. So Matt Rule and Baker Mayfield win the Pro Bowl. That's the same amount of wins that they have in real life. One. As you'll be able to see here by the team statistics, the NFC as a team only had 191 passing yards. Does that mean Christian Fulton's going to get his dev trade? It should. As we look at the numbers, Derrick Henry was pretty good, 90 yards and a touchdown, leading the game in rushing. And then the defensive stats right here, Trayvon Diggs with an interception. So yeah, it looks like Christian Fulton's going to go up in dev trade. He now has star development. So it's a little bit cheesy because Christian Fulton wasn't a pro bowler, but we completed the challenge fair and square. The NFC had less than 200 passing yards, so I think he deserves star development. And even so, he should have already had star development anyway. It was kind of disrespectful that he only had normal dev. So yeah, Christian Fulton has star dev next year. That's a pretty big deal. All right, let's go into Super Bowl week. The top-seeded Packers facing off against the seventh-seeded Bills. Again, go Bills. And sure enough, the Bills win Super Bowl 57, 28-10, with a 21-0 comeback in the second half. Aaron Rodgers throws three interceptions in this one. Josh Allen, meanwhile, throws two touchdowns. So congratulations to Bills Mafia. Keep your table safe because a Bills fan is probably going to jump and break it. The Super Bowl MVP was not Josh Allen. It actually went to Tremaine Edmonds, who had 12 tackles, one for a loss, and an interception. Madden loves giving the Super Bowl MVP to defensive players. I don't know why. I think Josh Allen probably deserved it, but Edmonds had a good game too. So it's fine. As long as the Packers lose, I'm happy. So that's going to wrap up the episode. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Next episode will be free agency. The following episode will be the NFL Draft Preview. And then the episode after that will be the NFL Draft. Since it's been a little while since the last episode, I'm going to try to get all three of the offseason videos up within the next week. And then after that, we will go full steam ahead into season number two of the series. As I kind of talked about earlier in the video, I think we're going to completely revamp this team. It's going to look way different going into next year. And I'm excited to see how the offseason ends up. I hope you guys are as well. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out. Tighten up.